Hello, dear audience. We are very happy to be with you again and have a chance to speak and share thoughts. We haven't forgotten that this show is called Feast of Healthy Thoughts, and we are going to share with you all the healthy thoughts we have, and we would like to get feedback and learn about your thoughts. What do you think first about the show and also about the topics that we discussed uh, from this studio. Last three conversations with Presbyterian Kiyaki was about love. And like love is endless, the conversation can be also endless. But we decided to stop after the third one, uh, thinking that for at the for that moment it's uh, kind of concluded. But there is another aspect of it, and we decided to speak about this aspect of love. Love is sacrificial. Love never ends and doesn't consider anything or count on anything. But there is the other side of it, that when someone loves, it can be taken for granted. And this is what we're going to speak about today. And Presbyteria is with us to give us uh, her thoughts and her experience that can be very helpful for any Christian that has a question about love. How much can I love? And if someone is taking advantage of my sacrificial love, what can I do? Or am I taking advantage of someone's love? Uh, thank you, Presbytera. Uh, I would like you to start with giving a little overall explanation of Christian love again one more time so then we can go to the next um, and start talking about uh, love that has been taken granted up for. Thank you, Arkady. Hi, okay. everyone. I think I'd like to respond to your question about a, a, a basic Christian understanding of love with something you just said, and that is taking advantage of love that might be expressed to us and taking for granted love that might be expressed to us because I think from a Christian perspective, that's a nice way to start. <laughs> we believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for us. Mm -hmm. And so we base our faith, we base our trust in reality with a capital R in the love of a God who loves us first, in the love of a God who gave up everything, whatever it means to be God, God changed somehow forever in ways we don't understand as a result of God's love for the world and for humanity especially. And so anything we do, paradoxically, when we're not mindful of this or not growing in this reality in a mindful way is our taking advantage or taking for granted this love. Now, this happens all the time. Mm -hmm. This happens to me every day. I probably, I've been doing this to this very moment. And so I'm not saying this to beat myself up or have everybody feel guilty. Oh, I'm not taking seriously the love God has given. It's just a wake-up call for us to again re-examine what does it mean to be created in the image and likeness of this God who loved us first. From the Christian perspective, since we all take advantage and mm -hmm. uh, take granted for, for the love that God gives us, is that okay to take granted for the love that our, our neighbors, our friends, our relatives give us? Because God has endless love and we have to kind of copy that. And if someone takes advantage of our love, is it okay to love more? Since we are created in the image and likeness of God, that means we are accountable to God and one another in how we live our lives, how we grow in this love, how we share this love. And love does, in the end, as you said, have a sacrificial, true agape love. True, sacri mm -hmm. true love is sacrificial. And we have to do that with our eyes open, and we have to do that with a kind of knowing maturity as we are able to do. And so when you said a couple of minutes ago, you know, how do we love, how do we not take for granted, how, we, how do we not take advantage of the love of our family members, the love of our friends, the people we work with, 
Uh, never mind the people we don't have so much love for or they love for us. How do, how do we do that? Uh, I think that it, this is uh, an invitation that uh, we need to think about more seriously. What, what I was thinking about driving in about this is, oh my gosh, this is uh, a discipline that needs to be cultivated. This is hard work. This is toil. It's like we have to cultivate our hearts and minds to be more aware of this because it's easy because of the nature of our lives. We have to, there's work we have to do. There are challenges we have to face. Uh, there are responsibilities that have to be attended to. We have, we have our successes. We have our failures. We have our joys. We have our pain. And, and there's a lot of pain out there. There's a lot of loneliness out there. Mm -hmm. And so through that, we still are called to cultivating uh, our hearts so that they can be more authentic in the way God desires us to be, to become loving persons uh, so that our hearts, uh, with God's help, obviously, can become merciful hearts, hearts that, that beat and share love. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to cultivate our hearts? Well, it just means paying more attention to our everyday lives. Uh, in the past couple of years, a lot has happened in my family life. You know, people have events that happen in their lives, and sometimes there's months or years that a lot of maybe sickness or illness, and I'm at that age where I've lost many relatives, mm -hmm. many uncles and aunts. I lost my dad two years ago. Uh, my mom was hospitalized um, two days ago for uh, something serious, and she's on the mend, we believe, so I'm very happy about that. But she's still in the hospital right now as we, as we um, speak. And so with my mom being in the hospital, um, and when she was first brought in, and when we heard from the doctors that uh, her heart was beating irregularly in a, in, a, in a way that wasn't good at all and that they were trying to uh, manage that and to, to see what, what would happen. I started being very afraid about what, what would it be like to lose my mom since I had not so long ago lost my dad. And it sh shakes everything up, the love that I've been taking for granted even now with my mom. We're managing, the, we're managing this, this crisis, we're managing her illness, and uh, do I go Yesterday, do I go to the seminary to teach my class up in Brookline? It's a three-hour class. My mom is in Falmouth on Cape Cod, so maybe there's 80 miles, 100 miles, I don't know, difference between the hospital and the seminary. Do I do one? Do I do the other? What do I do? And I realized that if I stayed with my mom, I would be missing out on the gift of being present to the students who've been entrusted to me for that period of time. And I would be taking for granted that love and trust of the students and the institution that hired me to do this job. Well, to make a long story short, I was able to, with God's help, despite the bad weather, do a little of both. I was able to see my mom, make sure that she had turned this corner, thank you God, and then go to the seminary. The point is that, uh, at least I think we had a good class considering everything, that I didn't want to take for granted the love that was, and the trust that was given to me, A, as a mom would, to her children, whom she needs now that she's in the hospital, and the students and the administration to whom I'm accountable in my, in my uh, job, my workday job on Mondays when I go to the seminary. In a sense, it was perfect timing for our discussion today that everything that, that we have a lot in our lives that are gifts, maybe they feel like responsibilities. My mom feels like a responsibility sometimes. But with all this, I realize, oh my gosh, she's a gift. The students getting the syllabus ready, get finding the books, finding and you know, whatever, getting things organized, feels a res like a responsibility, feels like a lot of work, feels um, like a rush because I have to go back uh, tonight and see my, my people in my office in Sandwich on, on Cape Cod. And so, and my, and my clients, the, the people I see in my office on Cape Cod, they, they in, in my day-to-day -day experience, they are a responsibility, they are work. Um, but when I take a step back, I realize they're, they're all a gift. They're all a way of me offering myself in a way to help the whole context, not just me or the person, but the, but the world that we influence better just by our engaging one another. And so this time of crisis has been, a, point, has been a, a time for me to reflect more 
how important it is not to take for granted the love that's already in our lives. And by doing that, we cultivate our hearts, we cultivate our awareness, we become more aware of sometimes what feels like work is mostly a gift. And so to start asking ourselves, okay, how could this responsibility, how could this work really be a gift for us? And to start experiencing what, how that might change our approach to this whole uh, dimension in our lives. That's the most touching story when you share something that you are going through, the experience. I want to tell a story from a book an Armenian writer is writing about the love that mother has. It's called, it's a poem, and it's called Mother's Heart. The wife of the boy or man asks him how much he loves her. And he says that he loves her endless and things. And so she says, to prove that, you have to bring me your mother's heart, which means his mother's physical end. The life has to be ended. And he does it to prove the love. And they say that when he was carrying his mother's heart, he trips over something and falls. And from the heart, there comes a voice. Oh, my son, did you hurt yourself? This is very, very impressive. And I always found that there is no greater love than that, that the mother that has been killed by his, her own son cares about that, own, that same son. And uh, uh, I was reading a non-Christian mystic writer who says that the greatest, that, that the humanity has been in a search of love since the creation or since the fall of Adam and Eve. And the greatest love that has been found on this earth is that what the mother can give to the children. What do you think? Is this true that that's the greatest love? Or a Christian can have a greater love for students? Like, for example, in your example, you had two choices. Your mother that is physically and emotionally completely connected to your life. And students whom you love because they are brothers and sisters or children that come from, from your faith, that you are connected with them. I know people who accept me like their son. We are physically not connected or genetically we don't have any connections. And in some respect they would take care of me spiritually better than my parents. I know that my mother loves me endlessly and she will be ready to die for me. But there are points where she's helpless. She cannot go over certain points that other people can and they, they consider me to be their son. There's many ways to approach that and I, I know a lot of friends of mine both in the field of psychology and civilian friends and friends in the church who would notice that sometimes there's a sacrificial love that's not healthy. I'll just mention that a little bit, which we would sometimes call codependence or unhealthy self-effacement, where it's not following through with the will of God for us in the context of that situation. And so I, I don't want to talk about that today. We've talked about that in the past, and I'm mm -hmm. sure, God willing, in the future we'll have conversations about this. But to talk about the mystery of love, what does it mean to have this loving heart? There are writers in the church that talk about Saint, I think it was Saint Macarius of Egypt, we've mentioned him on this, uh, in these conversations, who, and I said this earlier, but it was he who said this, that the disciples, the friends of Christ, were all humanity actually is called to cultivate a merciful heart in the way God's heart is merciful so that our heart aches with pain for anything else that's in pain, be it another human being or an animal, even a creature, or those, that's, those um, uh, I love it, those creepy crawler uh, snakes that slither on the ground. He said even those we have to have cultivate a merciful heart, God's aching, loving heart for all of creation. And so that's the kind of heart, I think, that's um, astounding 
and not logical from one perspective and yet true as Christians. And so when we think about cultivating a heart, you said a loving heart, you said a mother's heart, that's a good metaphor because even the Lord Jesus uses feminine imagery saying how I wish I could be like the mother hen gathering her chicks close at hand. So he's imaging to us that all of his friends, male and female, female, are called to cultivate this kind of loving, we want to call it mother's heart, but with a capital M, something beyond our regular understanding of what it means to be a mother. If Jesus, whom we believe is God, was using this terminology, he's talking about love in ways we haven't yet tasted, and yet we're called, he desires this for us. He's the best example of mother. <laughs> He's the best example of mother. Very good. That's, that's, a, that's a beautiful, and, and you're not the first to say that, by the way. So, so uh, that's a beautiful thing. I didn't expect to you to say That's right. Yeah, I didn't, ex didn't think you, you would be saying this today, at least. So I'm, I'm very happy that you're saying that. And so, but, but it's interesting because lately, and, and I'm a little embarrassed to say this, that I've had tastes in my life where, uh, because I don't have children, uh, God's given us other responsibilities, and that's not something that's... You have many children, I think. Well, <laughs> we, by, the, by God's humor, we have students, we have people who come to us for advice, we have friends that hang out. And so from this population of people whom we love and whom I think s some love us, um, there are a few who've become very close to us. And I found over time some that have become so close that I am changing, I am being crushed as a result of the love I have for these people. And, and that's sort of an astounding thing. And I'm finding that I'm having compassion for people I don't know that are in their lives. In fact, even people who may have been abusive to them, but because of my love, I've been crushed in love for these persons in my life. That my, my crushed heart, which I think maybe a mother's heart is a crushed heart, that's still beating, and somehow uh, God is, is uh, recreating from the pieces of the crushed heart <laughs> and, and turning it into something even more beautiful. That um, even in, in all the years I've been working with people, A, as a, as a Christian called to um, uh, share in the ministry of theology, or as a psychologist and pastoral psychotherapist in my office, I'm finding uh, depths of experience and love and connection with others that I wasn't experiencing 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so part of that is, is to allow ourselves to be crushed, allow ourselves to be crushed, but we're never alone, but we might feel alone, but to, be, uh, to make our being crushed an offering to God and sit there and walk through this valley of the shadow of death, how we may feel crushed, uh, trusting that God saturates the darkness and is leading us through the darkness to get to the other side, whatever, hap whatever that is. And, and there is another side, and then we find we're in new places on, as a result of that, and that we're different, and we're never the same again after that point. We spoke about Christ and His love as, as a love of a mother who cares endlessly and with no conditions, unconditional love like it's known in a the theology that Christ had unconditional love for us. But there are some points where he gives up on people. For example, he instructs his students, go to the house, tell them about me. If they accept you, stay with them. If not, shake your feet and leave. In other words, there is a limit to how much you can, how much you can sacrifice yourself endlessly and meaningless. If, it, if you feel like it's meaningless sacrifice, then you shouldn't do it. Like the disciples should leave and go for others who would take them. There's two ideas I'd like to share uh, with that example about Jesus saying to his uh, disciples and friends, when you want to share the good news and people reject it, you leave, you shake the dust out of your shoes and you go on. And that's a very powerful image mm -hmm. that has been used in a good way and I think abusively through Christian history. Two things come to mind. One for the disciple and the follower of Christ and one for the follower of Christ who's reaching out to the other party that may or may not be ready or is actively against whatever is being brought from a loving perspective 
to them. I think the first I'll say is regarding the other person, the other side. One of the images I, I use when I, with people I love who come to talk with me, and because I believe it's true, is it takes three to have a, have a real relationship. You, the other person, and God. Now, we can take that for granted or, or trust that. Right now I'll say we'll trust that. Um, but the third party is that other person. And so what's happening between us and the other person is like a bridge. I have to build my side of the bridge. The other person has to build their side of the bridge. And we build that bridge brick by brick. Now, I know too many people, myself included, where we want to be in relationship, in a healthy relationship with the person on the other side of the bridge so much that we will build our side of the bridge and keep going and build their side for them. We will do that. Mm -hmm. I've done that. And that's wrong. That's unhealthy. I'd even say that's sinful. But we don't know that because we're trying to act out of love. We're trying to build bridges. And, and so why is it sinful? I know there might be some people saying, who might be hearing this saying, oh my gosh, what is she talking about? We're, God wants us to reach out. Yes, but we're all created in the image and likeness of God. We all have been given the capacity for free will. And for me to try to extract love from another person is manipulation. And so God doesn't force us to love him. And so by that same example, we are not to force others to love us. And so it is important to respect their freedom. And so that's a sacrifice, to still love another person and at the same time experience the lack of love coming back. That causes, especially if we want to be in relationship with that other person, at the very least, it causes us to shudder inside. It's, it's unacceptable, and yet, uh, and we'll do lots of things. I used to eat a lot, <laughs> unhealthy, unhealthy foods, uh, and unhealthy things, because it was so hard to bear the lack of reciprocity. I'd rather eat myself into a stupor. I'd rather drink myself into a stupor. I'd rather anesthetize myself quite rightly sometimes, then bear acknowledging completely the lack of love that is coming. Because what, was, what will usually happen with that, with that? We cry. We cry a river of tears. We cry and cry and cry. Now, crying a river of tears for some people might take two minutes, for some people five years. But the, to acknowledge that is, is, changes us. So, um, but that's the first half. We can't. And so what I share with people is, all we can do is build ours brick by brick. When we get to that halfway point and the others are, are still saying nothing doing or ignoring us or are partying in ways that we see as destructive for them, mm -hmm. um, I will say, well, then whatever your imagination allows, post somebody at that part of the, your bridge. Uh, whatever that is. Is it, is it an angel? Is it whatever? I'll say whatever comes up from your depths. Post a sentry at that part of the bridge and wait. You, you can pray and, and wait, but you cannot even put one brick on the, old. on the other side. You cannot. And so if you and the sentry are both crying, that's okay. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. it's, worth, it's worth it. So as you have the sentry there and you and the sentry are crying, you go on with your life. Now, I think the other part about the Lord saying to his disciples, shake the, shoe, take, shake the shoes out and, um, and, and not even take some of the dust with you, all right? It, it does two things. Number one, it tells the disciple not to take with him or her anything that calls attention away from the love of God. So if any of that, if any of that pollution from that place is... Uh, worshiping false idols, and there's all kinds of false idols all over the place that's trying to get our attention, um, we are not called to take that with us. So that's one reason why we're supposed to empty out our shoes. That's, mm -hmm. the, I think, one spiritual and theological meaning. From a psychological perspective, I think the Lord is saying that to, to his loved ones because it hurts. It's hard. And to be sad and not bitter because it's so easy to be bitter. It's so easy to be cynical when we're not loved. And, and it's better to walk away wounded and see how God changes us as we continue on with our journey and strengthens us in new ways than to be contorted with resentment, which it's so easy to do. 
Mm -hmm. uh, another, another story from the New Testament, what Christ does. When they come and tell him that your brothers and sisters are waiting outside for you, and he and mother, he points to his disciples and says, "These are these are my mothers and sisters and, and brothers." And um, in other words, no matter how much love you can have towards that other party who is not building the bridge, you don't need them. You need somebody who is already built it. Who has, who has already built the other part and is waiting for you. To hear the word and do it, and it's hard to do it. Uh, some English translations are, and to keep it. There's a, there's a kind of ongoing work. Mm -hmm. It's not just you do it once and I'm done. There's a kind of ongoing 24 hours a day, seven days a week work discipline that is, that is demanded of, of, of following through in this, in this way. He will not force his love on us. He will not. He can't. But because he's God, he'll do any way. He, he, he will work for all of our lives within the context of our own everyday existence. So that's different for all of us to try to reach out to us, to try to touch us, to try to be with us. We may not understand it. Um, I'm thinking of, and I've used this example in the past, maybe for different reasons, of Helen Keller and Jane Sullivan, the, the, the famous woman that was both blind and deaf, and her mm -hmm. teacher, Jane Sullivan, when she taught her uh, when Jane taught Aunt, um, Helen Keller uh, how to, ab about words and about writing and spelling and that she could communicate with the world and connect with the world in a brand new way through words and through, through language and writing. And so uh, the story says that she would, would, would hand signal the word water over and over and over and over again. This went on for weeks, months, over and over and over again. In some ways, and, then, and Helen Keller didn't understand for the longest time. In, so, in, in many ways, God is like Jane Sullivan to us, that God is reaching out to us over and over and over again in ways we don't understand. And like Helen Keller, not getting it, you know, for the longest time, until something happens when we are maybe a little bit more receptive and and we acknowledge and receive God's love from that angle that he's trying to reach us through. God's got a sense of humor. He'll find lots of ways to reach us to the point where if we think about it from God's perspective, he's laughing with, with humor at us. And I, I, I was just saying to a friend, and I wish I could, in a way it's good, I don't remember, but I did something silly about the irony of how the th silly things happened. It was just so perfect, and it was, you know, that I thought, oh, God is laughing so hard at me. He's fallen off his throne, thumping on the floor in heaven. He's laughing so hard at me, you know, because of, of, of whatever, of, of, of um, how perfect trying to teach me a certain lesson was. I mean, maybe other people have had some of these examples. It's just funny. So I, so I think God's always reaching out, always trying. In the ancient times, in the poetry, we see that somebody loses love and commit suicide or goes crazy or all kinds of things. It's so deep and it contains their entire being and without it they cannot do anything. Uh, recently I had a chance to speak with this boy who has been in friendship with a girl but for some reason they haven't gotten very serious and he was kind of um, worried and um, suffering that how is he going to do to build a closer relationship. And we talked, I give him some advice from my very little experience, and he said, okay. Then after a while I heard that the girl has a boyfriend, someone else. And when I met the guy, I said, well, well what happened? How, how did you do this? You lost her. He's like, yeah. And then he left, and then after a couple of days, we had a chance again to talk about this. He says, don't worry about it. There are other fish in the sea. That was uh, strange to me, a little bit. In the same time, I was happy for him, so he's not suffering over it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also tells me that it wasn't really a serious love that he had for her. Uh, and this is, I think, common issue, common problem in the modern society. They uh, go from one person to another. It's like a, f a fish in the sea. It's not a fish. There are many other people there, 
and it's, it's good that you're not killing yourself over somebody. But it's not fish. Right. One of the images that come to mind for me when I hear your story is um, it's as if uh, he's driving his car and his girlfriend is one of the tires. He's got three other tires, by the way. I don't know what that stands for. But the girlfriend, that tire blows out for some reason. Okay, change the tire. <laughs> you know, put, put a temporary tire, and he'll move, you know, he'll, you know, he'll move along at a slower pace, and then eventually he'll get a new tire and keep going. And people are not like tires. Although I'm sure most people listening to us will have an experience at least once in their lives, if not many times in their lives, of feeling like they were the tire. Mm -hmm. Um, that we were replaceable. In fact, once we were used in ways that um, uh, took the best out of us, we were, take, we were removed from service and some, some other entity much fresher with better tread was replaced and the, tire, and, and the, and the, the, the other party's car kept rolling along. Um, that's not a healthy relationship. That might be, you might, we could call that a relationship, but that's not a healthy relationship. It's not a growing relationship. It takes more um, work, it takes more love, it takes more courage to sit and face one another, face on face, face to face, and be with one another. Um, that's a mystery beyond our understanding. Even just to sit, just you and I as friends, mm -hmm. you know, there's only one you in my life. And so, um, to sit in the presence of God with, with other people right now, but, and you. Um, this is unrepeatable. And for me to appreciate the time with you this moment um, changes me. And so that's different than, than looking at each other as tires that can be replaced yeah. on, our, on our automobile of life. The story of the prodigal son. The son leaves the father. Father keeps loving him but he doesn't follow, he doesn't go after him and bring him back. But when he comes back, he accepts him with love. And this is, I think, the best example for God's love, how God loves us. Now, in, 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 our, in our society, when you see that somebody took advantage of your love, you gave him, gave him or her or whatever, and they didn't give enough uh, credit for that love, but then they start realizing that they're making a mistake. Um, how hard it is to, to restore your love, because once you are not responded, it shakes you and it destroys what you have built. You know, if, if you build one half of the bridge and you wait there, wait there, wait there, and it gets old, it starts falling apart over time, and then all of a sudden you see they have built their part already, but yours is not there anymore. Uh, how hard is it to restore relationship? What's wonderful is if we approach the relationship with a little humility, and that's another word that's loaded and people misunderstand that, but with a little bit of openness to, I'm not in charge, I'm not in control, Let's see what will happen. Miracles happen. I've seen miracles. Many miracles happen in my life uh -huh. on this level. But, but that's why I like the, the, but the part I didn't hear you say about building our side of the bridge. Um, that's why I say we build our side of the bridge and we put a sentry there. Okay. Okay, and that sentry, whatever that represents from our inner depths, whatever is true, because not everybody I see in, in my work is a Christian. And so I don't want to impose my imagery on, on people come to see me. So, so they'll come up with their own imagery of whatever is true for them. Because between you and me and everybody listening, um, for <laughs> and me, the world. And, and the world, but, but, but for me, truth is a person. So that's what I believe. And so w whatever the other person believes when they're in relationship with me and we're talking, that's up to them. But that's where I'm coming from. And so when they build their side of the bridge, and they're in pain waiting for their beloved other to build their side, which may or may never, never happen. Um, if they put a sentry there, now remember that sentry is re representing, is someplace from the, their best depths, which for you and me is in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. 
then that side of the bridge does not decompose in the way, let's say, in the, physical in, in, in the, in the way the physical world would, would have it. Now, how would it change? I don't know, because hopefully we're still growing as we have our century waiting. And so when perhaps by the miracle of someone, in a sense, resurrecting from the dead, because that's what it feels like sometimes, when someone authentically um, wants to build their side and meet you, um, that's the joy. That's the, that's a, it's like a, a revolution of love that occurs. This is the, the story of the prodigal son that you mentioned, where when the son returns, when the young son returns after having spent all of his father's money, but truly contrite, truly broken, realizing, what have I done? And the scriptures say, have a line that, that says something that he came back to himself. There's something to, to his truth about his own self in relationship with others and, and his whole life that um, he owned up to and accepted. And he, and he went back accepting whatever the father would offer, even being hired as a, as a, as a slave, which is what the Greek points to. It's not just a worker <laughs> that we understand, but to come back as a slave, because even my, my father's slaves were treated better than the way I was treated out there. It's a miracle when relationships are resurrected from the dead in ways that um, we didn't expect. And to even have a sentry posted there that it could happen somehow makes room for miracles in our own lives and the lives of other people whom we touch. Mm -hmm. Now, if I, if I want to put it in a uh, very short sentence, when someone takes advantage of our love, takes it for granted, we don't follow and waste our love, but we never cease from loving them. We still love them, but we don't waste that love until they're ready to respond to it. I agree with you. I'll go one step further. And that is by, for example, not trying to build the other side of the bridge. It means mm -hmm. we change somehow. We have to let go and go on. That takes more love. Mm. That takes more love. That's why I say have a sentry there because the sentry is also connected to our pain. It's also connected to the truth of our experience of our life. And so it takes more love to move on. And otherwise we are feeding a lie. We are feeding a bad love by trying to build the bridge that's none of our business to build. And actually we're feeding a delusion. If you're giving love and you think that it's supposed to be responded and it's not and you keep giving and giving and giving, you have a strong reason for that. And to leave and go would take a lot of strength and understanding that giving and staying is going to cause more harm than... That's why it's good to ask for help. A, we pray, we ask God for help with these things. B, we talk to other people whom we respect, who are wiser. So we pick up, as they say in AA, pick up the 500-pound phone and you make a phone call to people you love and respect to help us, to help us um, discern through this kind of a crisis. Because this is a crisis. Now in Chinese, most people who've done a little bit of work in this area will say the Chinese character for crisis points to a, a fork in the road where one has to choose which way to go, uh, and which is more uh, life-giving for the person on, on the journey. Actually, in the Greek, that's not too far for, from the Greek understanding of the word crisis also, which I thought was interesting. Discerning the right answer when it's time might be simple, but it's not easy. We have to be extremely careful and very, very aware of things, because it will be really hard to tell if they're building their side or not. Right. We may get to used to, or the audience may get the wrong idea that, all right, this is the suggestion. You do a step, they don't, you walk away. Right. That's why, that's why I'm, let me interrupt you a second. That's why I'm glad uh, we're having this part of the conversation, that uh, it's not just, oh, you know, tit for tat. Uh, there's there, there's a, a, a line from the teachings of the, of the Lord where Jesus says, by their fruits you will know them. Mm -hmm. Well, in order to, to discern the fruits, you have to plant the seed, you have to do the watering, and then you have to wait a while. So sometimes you have to wait a long time to see what the fruits are like. So sometimes the fruits are very clearly evident at the beginning, 
they make you make the discernments then and sometimes the fruits are not known for a long time you know and, and sometimes the fruits look good but then when you taste them there's no nutrition and it's a false fruit so so there's many permutations of how do we discern what the reality is set before us and sometimes yes we do give we do offer and remember we've been saying this often together that God knows our hearts God knows our intentions and, and is with us and suffers with us because, because if our intentions are to do the good, even if we are enabling, meaning we are somehow feeding something that's not good going on, and we don't know that, we're just trying, we're doing this action uh, for the sake of the good, that eventually we'll discern we've, we've gone over a line and then, mm -hmm. and then we, we stop building the other side of the bridge and we go back to where we should, should be, we put a sentry there and we move on. Yes. The other side of this is that love is not directed to certain object and it's not um, expressed in certain situations. I have seen loving people who just love and that's their nature. They cannot be otherwise. And so with this kind of a person, even when you make a mistake, you know that when you go back, that love is still going to be there. It does not depend on you, it depends on them. It's them who love. It doesn't have to do anything with your mistake or with your respond. They may not uh, chase you for response, but any time you respond, that love is, haven't, hasn't disappeared. Same way with God, I think. Anytime somebody repents and goes back to the right way, he's there, he's, he hasn't gone anywhere. He's always there. I wish I could meet those people. <laughs> it's a quality. Love is a quality and no matter what the circumstances are, we, if we are gifted with that quality, we're going to love. And whenever the response comes, we will um, communicate. But also, as a human being, do you think that in this world, very cold, very individualistic, very um, selfish sometimes, when you keep giving and giving and giving and giving and not getting anything in response, do you think that it wears you out as a human being and at one point you say, I'm, I'm going to be the same way that everybody else is and I don't want to do anything anymore? That's called burnout. <laughs> <laughs> that happens to a lot of really good people and people can get burned out. And I, I remember one preacher used to say, don't call it a burnout, it's okay to call it a brownout. So that when you get to that place where you are so um, overextended, so exhausted, life brings those situations. Sometimes we do get overextended, sometimes we have to race around and do many things that we normally wouldn't do because of the crises. I talked about crises in my own life recently. That it's very easy to get into these places where we're completely spent and we feel nothing. And these are dangerous places. We can get sick, uh, we can make bad decisions, uh, and uh, we can just be less careful because we're just so spent. So it's a dangerous time. So it's important to realize when we're there or beginning to get there, maybe at the beginning of the brownout, and, and some of us, it's too fast and we realize, uh, to, to realize this, but those of us who can, or as soon as we can, uh, we have to halt. We have to, uh, are we feeling, uh, this is um, an, an expression from one of the other 12-step groups, hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. H-A-L-T, halt. Mm -hmm. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired, st tired. stop. And, and, and step back and reassess what's going on. Because, because something imbalanced is happening. And when we're in that imbalance, then we are not taking the uh, it, we're not expressing love for self, care for self. Now, there's just two types of love for mm -hmm. the self. One is love for self, care for self, meaning how do we stay relatively healthy? How do we, do we get enough sleep? Are we doing the work we need to be doing so we're prepared for the, the work, let's say, are we studying what we're studying, we need to study so that we can be prepared for the work that we'll be called to do? And, and, and all of that, and so, the, Preparation and rest, nutrition, recreation, having taken some time to, even God rested on the seventh day, that means something about life. To savor, this, this world is still good. 
despite, and, and we have to be careful, and many Christians have to be careful especially, that we're naming a lot of the sin that we see, but this is still God's world. And, and God is, and yes, the evil one is out there running rampant and having a great time as far as I'm concerned with, with all the toys that are out there distracting people's attention. Uh, and all the greed and, 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 and avarice and all that, that is, I think, multiplying now. That still does not take away one iota of truth that this is still God's world. And so if God rested, we too are called to rest and to savor the good that is in this life. Mm -hmm. And so that's also nutritious and helping us restore our batteries, so to speak. Um, and so that's love and care for self. Then there's the sin, love of self, or selfishness, when it's all about us, I count, it's me, 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 and everybody else is basically a tire which can be replaced in my car of life. <laughs> <laughs> this shows the, the extent of forgiveness and the importance of the forgiveness and how can it heal. When, uh, when, you, get, when you get forgiveness, you can also forgive uh, others. Uh, to the wider extent, it's the forgiveness that we get from God. And when we're browned out, we look at ourselves and we're in the middle, God is here, and the rest of the world who burns us is here. So if we compare us with the world that burns us, we feel sorry for ourselves. But when we compare us with God, then we feel sorry for God who is burned out by our disobedience or mis misbehavior, then it's kind of a balance between those two, so we can keep going. We know that God is forgiving us so much that not, only, not even 1% of that we can forgive others who are not responding to our love. And the story what I wanted to tell is, I always in my life tried not to have any enemies or people who have hard feelings against me and I always wanted to have found a way to uh, smoothen it out. But there was a time when some people did something and I did the opposite and they were wrong and I was wrong too and I couldn't restore it. And it always tor tortured me, I was always in my heart. And the solution I found when I met a very um, respected person who had to do something, some relationship with her, and he said, don't worry, you have made a mistake, or whatever, or you think you have made a mistake, but it's okay. You're still part of, part of us, you're not a foreigner. Just forget about it and go ahead. And I, at that moment, I realized how much compassion that person had and how he just forgave me without, without asking questions, without even wanting to know what happened or what, is, what are the details. And from that moment on, it was very easy to forgive the party that I had a conflict with. And it, it worked out very well. So I think in, in, in a human relationship, it's always good to compare ourselves with God and say how God is loving us. We're not responding to Him. And He keeps loving us, loving us, and every chance we give, He takes. And the same way we can do towards the others. Um, I think we're out running out of time. What would your suggestion in this topic to the people who listened to the whole conversation and now they may be confused? because we gave different aspects of the same, uh, same issue, same uh, topic. What would your suggestion be to the audience uh, in, as a formula? Is there such a thing? Relax. <laughs> Relax in the presence of God. Trust in the presence of God. I think what you did, that example, and you, you were very wise not to name names, <laughs> but you could have been talking about me. I, I was just thinking as you were saying this, oh, I know what it's like to be in a doghouse. 
<laughs> I've been there many times, you know, but what happens in the doghouse is, well, someone's always going to be in the doghouse, you know, and so, I mean, in fact, if anyone else is in the doghouse after me, you know, you can see my um, graffiti on the walls because <laughs> the doghouse isn't very big. And so, uh, so when you're in the doghouse by a certain group or persons or so and so, you might be there for a while. It tends to be a long stay and it's never good. And each time I'm in the doghouse, it's never the same. It ne it's never comfortable. But eventually, because life is what it is, someone else gets pushed into the doghouse and you wind up being unceremoniously pushed out from behind <laughs> and having to clean yourself up and find a new way to start up again. But what you did was um, basically you trusted God. You named the sin, be it your own or someone else's, and you trusted God. And it's important not to be in denial when things are wrong. It's okay to say, look God, you know, we can make this part of our complaint to God. Yes, it's not great to sit around and whine all day to God, but you know, sometimes it's time to complain. It's even time to whine, you know, and, you, and, and let, let the heartache be shared with God. God wants, wants authentic connection with Him. And so you name the sin that you experienced as, as best as, and fully as you knew how. You named your own participation as best as you knew how in that moment. And then you proceeded with your life. And then when you found someone else who happened to be maybe a little bit more a veteran than you in this whole uh, situation, experienced the kind of love and compassion that from a human level that maybe was already happening from God's side, it, it, it really quickly restored you. Yeah. And, and I think others, I'm hoping, have had tastes of this or, or can at least intuit what we're talking about. Thank you very much. Uh, we are out of time for this uh, conversation and hopefully we'll have other conversations that will enlighten more aspects and more darker corners of this because it's for every single individual is life is different and there can be different nuances and things and if there are questions dear audience you're welcome to send us an email you can see the email address on the screen and the phone numbers and we will try to uh, explain it the best that we can. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Presbytera, and have a good day.